Welcome everybody. Marty McCartney here from Anvic Building Systems and we are about to start another installation training webinar. So today's title is Anvic ICF Installation Training and we're looking at level two. Again, my name is Marty McCartney. I'm the training and field technical support manager here at Anvic. I have about 40 years of experience in the construction industry of which about 20 years of that I've worked with ICF construction. And one of my main goals is to try and minimize other people's learning curve when it comes to build, building with Anvic ICF products. During this training session, we're going to look at footings, so how to deal with standing seams, installation of brick ledge, floor connections, window door openings in the walls, height adjusters, roof connections, and then we'll do discuss some technical resources that are available here at Amvic. Okay, so we're gonna start with footings, which is a great place to start, obviously. We're gonna build our building above that. We have a Canadian design guide that has all kinds of information in it as to how the dowels should be placed, what size they should be, whether 10M or 15M, how much they're supposed to be put into the footing to, to, based on the design required. And what we do is we have charts that tell you how to space it out based on our ICF blocks. So in this particular case, you would find the actual block you're working with, get some of the measurements inside, outside, 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 and start laying out where these vertical dowels are gonna be. In this particular case, you got your eight foot, 11 and a half inch inside, outside, you got your 10 foot, two outside, outside, and you lay it out and start laying the dowels in place. When they get wet set or pre-tied, depending on what you're gonna do on your site, so this one here shows that uh, after the pour, obviously, but sometimes they get tied in place before you pour, support it, leveled up, and then you pour your concrete. Other times you simply pour your footing, have it all marked out, and set your wet, wet set your dowels into place. This particular slide shows starting with the corners, as we always do, start from the corners, move to the center of the walls, and it illustrates that your rebar is missing your webs and it's also in the cavity where the concrete's gonna go. I jokingly tell people when they ask me where the rebar dowel should be, I said, wherever the concrete is. I don't want it in, out coming up through the foam, but realistically, it's just a matter of making sure that it's in that cavity so that it gets encased with concrete and ties your wall to your footing. So there's what looks like a complete row around. Rebars are still sticking up because in most cases they're approximately 24 inches above the footing. That allows you to get a really good splice overlap with the vertical rebars that you're gonna put in the top of the wall when you get to the top of wall before you pour. And the second row continues on the same way. And obviously you can't see the dowels anymore. But again, once you get to the top of this wall, you'll be setting your verticals in there. It'll create the rebar lap splice that's required to connect your wall to your footing properly. Two illustrations of footings, this basement on the left, an actual frost wall on the right. So what happens here, again, it illustrates the bent dowel on the footing. Same situation with the frost wall. The only difference being on the basement, obviously you're gonna backfill to a certain height on the outside of the wall with your slab on the inside to help with that shear protection. And on the frost footing, you're gonna have backfill outside and inside to come up and carry your slab. You can also do what's called a frost protected shallow foundation. That's a situation whereby you can't get a full depth that's required for the frost protection in your area. So we deal with this by having horizontal rigid insulation on the outside of the wall at whatever depth is available to work with. So in the particular case here, you've got the left-hand side, it's a regular ICF wall down to a standard footing the insulation is tapered outward from the outside of the wall to allow for frost protection. And the one on the right hand side is what we call a thickened edge slab. So again, you have your insulation under your slab, but on the outside of the wall, which is not protected, and you may not have the frost depth, you have to do that horizontal rigid insulation to achieve this. The other way to work with uh, ICF blocks is if you have to scribe to bedrock. What you end up doing is you'll have your dowels, you'll drill, lay them out, drill them, epoxy them in. That gives you a connection to your bedrock. What I like to do is get my second row set up, leveled, 
and then we measure down and scribe the blocks to fit underneath that row to come down to the bedrock as best possible. And then you may have to use some vertical stakes or whatever to get keep it stable. But it, realistically, you're scribing to match the ground, and it's quite easy to do because you're working with EPS. Next item on the list is a sanding seam, also known as a stack joint. So when you start from your corners and move towards the center of the wall, and you actually get to the last piece that has to be cut to fit, there are times when that's either a even number or an odd number. With the Anvic forms, we have a two inch interlock system. So we work with even numbers in order for the interlock to work above and below whenever possible. But there's nothing wrong with creating a standing seam to hit your wall length exactly. So what we do is we cut the block, fit that block into that cavity, and then the row above, what will end up happening is the left side will cut to that same mark, the right side you'll cut, and when the two go together, it'll create a nice solid wall. What ends up happening is the spacing on the webs will change, so you won't have your actual spacing. And because, it, once again, we've compromised the block, so we have to reinforce it. So in this particular case, we're going to put horizontal cleats on each side, front and back, across that cut seam to make sure we have our strength of our forms again. Carry on to the next level, and basically what happens is one, three, five should match, and two, four, six should match as you move up your wall. And again, very important, because you've compromised that form by cutting the end interlock off, you want to horizontally strap it. Carrying up next level, same procedure, just keep moving up, cut the blocks, and you can see that standing seam just carries on straight up the same spot as you normally would in the wall. Here we've added the strong backs at a certain height. And again, strong backs gives you your platform, your safety rails, and you again carry on uh, cleating as you move up the wall. Just... And we just keep carrying on up till we get to the top of the wall. One of the things that happens is if you have an opening and you're creating a standing seam in that wall on the very first row, you can also plan to make sure that standing seam is either going to be at a window or a door opening. What that does for you is it allows you to only deal with that standing seam below and above the window or above the door. It just minimizes the number of times you're dealing with that cut block. Next item on the list is brick ledge. Anvic has a pre-molded brick ledge in our most commonly used blocks. And we also have a kit, which is a brick ledge extension that gets assembled and applied to the blocks from on the exterior side or sometimes even on the inside. So the one on the left, we have a standard brick ledge. And what you're going to use there is you're going to use the actual rebar stirrups. And the brick ledge will be constructed, rebar in place, wall will be poured, stacked to the top of the wall, filled with concrete, and you have your brick ledge on the outside. The one on the center is we have a brick ledge reinforcer that's been designed. Again, you need to go into our guides and make sure that you're well within the specifications to use that product. But it's much quicker on the site to be able to drop that tray in there and carry on up with your wall. Brick ledge can also be used on the inside of a wall to carry a floor system, whether it be wood or concrete. And it works very well. You just want to make sure you hit your mark on your elevation to make sure it's correct. When it comes to brick ledge corners, always interesting. It's basically like cutting a crown mold. You'll cut the first uh, three wrong, you'll cut one right, and then you'll have one that goes wrong again on you. But realistically, it's foam. Once you get used to doing it, it's not that difficult. This particular case, we lay the straight blocks out, put your corner in, put your brick ledge on top of that, and then we're now going to fit that corner in there. Because the brick ledge has only come in a four foot straight form, we have to miter cut each corner on site, whether it's inside or outside. So particular here, we're showing an outside corner. We had miter cut it, put it on, match the other side to it, put it in place. Now we have a complete continuous book, book ledge around that corner. Carry on up your wall and get ready to pour. 
When it comes to brick ledge extensions, if you're putting it on a straight wall, you're going to notch out between the webs. And one of the key items here is down the bottom of the cut. It's not just a straight cut. You want to cut that on an angle, 30, 40, 50 degrees, just to get that concrete to give you a nice solid corner there and flow out into that book brick ledge properly. You'll have your spacers and then your brick ledge extension will go into place and gets fastened in with the screws that are part of the kit. And it looks like so when it's finished. So nice and clean profile has a place for your rebar to hold because of the spacer and it's, you're putting on about eight feet at a time. Some of our forms don't have a pre mold brick ledge. So what we can use this one or if you're using a brick ledge at an elevation that's not conducive to the stacking of the blocks, you can put it anywhere in, a, in the elevation of the height of the wall. Then you carry on stacking the wall above. The other interesting thing about our brick ledge extension is you can marry it up to a regular brick ledge form. If you're short a brick ledge, for instance, on the site, or you've got to do something in, that's out of the normal, it's the same profile, so it matches perfectly. When it comes to doing brick ledge corners with the extensions, it's almost the same principle as doing it on the straight. Basically, you're going to put a corner on there. You put your blocks to the coming towards that corner, and then you're going to notch out the same as we did with the straight, allow that concrete to come through, taper that bottom cut to help that concrete give you a real nice joint where it starts to flow out into the brick ledge. Then you're going to miter cut the brick ledge extension, fit it into place, repeat that on the opposite side. Now you have an actual corner with a brick ledge extension cut and fit to the corner and it matches the other brick ledge properly. And what's a bonus on the site, if you have a bunch of these to do, you can actually pre-make these and have them ready to stack up by the time the guys get up to that level. So you can pre-make the corners and you also are working with the strength of the actual corner molded block with the brick ledge extension on it. So it's a much stronger corner than just putting the actual miter cut of the brick ledge. Put your reinforcing in. One of the tricks is to make sure that reinforcing crosses over in that corner to give you the same required uh, support for the brick going up. And then you carry on stacking your blocks to top a wall, get ready to pour, and continue putting your rebar, et cetera, et cetera. Next item on the list is our floor connections. So for years, we've used a bent angled rod. We would have to put nut and washers on both sides of a plate, cut our walls, allow for this to be fastened in, make it nice and straight. You take your ledger, you got to hammer the ledger, dents in, the rod puts a dent in it, then you got to drill it, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on a lot, very, very labor intensive. So here at Anvic, we strongly promote the Simpson Strong Tie ICF VL system. That system comes together as a base plate, a J bracket, whether it's for nominal lumber or LVL, and the attaching screws. So what ends up happening is you stack your wall up to top a wall, and then you're going to laser for the bottom of the ledger. On that laser line, you're going to tap the base plate into place. Normally what I do is I grab my drywall saw and I just create a void there through the the EPS for those legs to fit in properly makes it a lot easier. You push it back into place. You got to make sure you're straddling a web. That way you can utilize that hole in the middle to put a screw into the web that holds that plate in place during concrete pour and make sure it doesn't pop out of the wall on you. Vadim's done a great illustration here on the right hand side that shows the inside of the wall with the rebar and those legs protruding into the concrete. The holes are part of the design because the concrete gets encased around those, through those, and make sure it, it doesn't pull out from the wall when you fasten your ledger on place. And then the most important part, when you go to put your ledger on, the beauty of this system, it allows you to re-laser the bottom of the ledger, and it gives you some wiggle room to make sure you get exactly where you want it. And then the second most important thing is make sure you use the right J bracket for the right ledger. There's 
inch and a half for nominal lumber, and there's inch and three quarter for what we call the LVL ledgers. And the ledger has to be put on properly so that the long side of the J bracket is on the outside of the ledger. You fasten through that ledger, through the bracket, through the ledger, into the back plate. If you're struggling with putting those screws in through the wood, it's just as easy to take a drill, pre-drill the wood part, and then let those self-tapping screws go through the J bracket back into that base plate. Looks nice and clean, very strong system because the weight's being distributed along the whole wall. And then you carry on, put your joist hangers in, put your joists in, fasten your sheeting on, whether it's plywood or OSB, and gives you a very strong connection to that ICF wall. Also laterally supports the wall at that elevation to make sure you're meeting code. Next item on the list is openings, doors, windows, et cetera, et cetera. So this particular one shows three different types of bucking. The one on the left is if you're using a full width buck, which matches up both sides of the width of the, the actual ICF you're using. And then the one on the right is if you just want to do the center core only. So you would cut that down. If it's a six inch core, you'd probably use a two by six, screw it to one side, foam the gap that's left, and then screw the other side together once that foam is set up. The most important part of these window bucks is the bottom is always left open in some manner to allow you to get concrete into the bottom of that sill and also to vibrate. The one in the middle is probably my most preferred buck. The reason I like it is because you have the buck goes to the inside of the outside panel, to the inside of the inside panel, and it keeps that insulation all the way around the buck on the outside, but it gives you something to fasten your trim to on the inside of the wall. This particular one works really well with our R30 products because the six inch R30 is basically nine and a quarter inches, so a two by 10 works perfect. And on the eight inch product, it's the two by 12 becomes 11 and a quarter, and it just works out exactly the way you're supposed to work it. Any other time we tend to have to rip that, that wood and make it fit that so that it's tight, flush on both sides of the ICF. If you're using treated lumber or pressure, un, untreated lumber or pressure treated lumber, in most cases you should have something in between the concrete and the wood, more so for the untreated. So what you wanna do is wrap it in poly, use a sill gasket stapled around where it's gonna match up to the concrete especially. And the other thing about using the sill gasket is it's a bit of a sponge. So what, when the concrete shrinks during drying, that helps seal that even. And then there's fastening the bucks to the concrete. So you can put screws or nails in through and leave the head sticking up to gr grab the concrete. And we can also use a power nail and come from below and put it in, shoot them in on an angle. All you're trying to do is catch that wet concrete so when it dries around the screws, the nails, whichever, it's holding that buck to the concrete properly. So when it comes to window reinforcement, again, Anvic has the Canadian Design Guide and the American Design Guide to allow us to check and make sure we're following the guides that we have to for, adhere to for the different building codes. Two types of reinforcing, in my opinion. One is for reinforcing the buck itself to, for the weight of concrete that's gonna be in there. So here's a very quick example of a vertical horizontal support inside that buck to keep the sides and top and bottom from bowing. Here's how it looks as a nice cutaway just to give you an idea what's really happening at your webs. You got your buck, the buck is open at the bottom and it's, revert, it's reinforced horizontally and vertically to take the weight for when you pour that concrete in there. In most cases, you're gonna have some kind of rebar in the bottom. This one in particular shows two 10M bars across the bottom of the opening, expanding 24 inches each way to create a, almost like a grade beam below that window to help with strength. You're gonna have two 10 or 15M bars vertical on each side of the opening, which gives you that nice box look and reinforcement for tilting of that window buck. And then you have some kind of lentil design. It could be as little as one rebar 
multiple rebars. It could be a top and bottom rebar system whereby you have stirrups. The tables have all that information depending on the length of that opening. And then you have the whole wall assembly. It's pretty awesome to see a cutaway like this where you can see the actual vertical horizontal reinforcement rebar along with the, what's required around an opening. So you get your bottom rebar sticking two feet past, you got your lentil sticking two feet past at the top, and then you have the extra vertical reinforcement on each side of the opening to help just strengthen that wall all the way around that complete opening. And then there's exterior reinforcement. So you want to want to tie that buck back to the wall. So in this particular case, we just simply put cleats around that fasten into the webs and also into that buck so that if you have to tilt that wall or do anything with that wall, the window buck has become part of that wall. Next item on the list would be the height adjusters. There's a couple different ways of doing this. Anvic provides a four inch reversible factory molded height adjuster. The downside to that particular product if used in the wrong spot, it doesn't have a cross web or anything to fasten to. So you got to make sure you're going to put it in the proper place in the wall. And then we have site fabrication of brick uh, height adjusters. So what happens with it is we can determine what they have to be and actually create them on site. So if we happen to want to put a height adjuster in the middle of a wall, we'll stack the wall up to the required height. We'll install the pieces of height adjusters. They're four inches high. And then we carry on with the next row. So we end up with a full block above and a full block below, encasing that height adjuster. And then you're going to want to connect that. So we put cleats on that be wide enough to fasten into the webs down below and the webs above. And that's going to hold that adjuster in place. And it'll help you reinforce it for concrete pour. And then you carry on up to the top of the wall. Now, if you want to actually fabricate on site, so what I'll do is I'll stop and determine my height of wall and decide if my what I have to do to my forms to hit my exact height required. And because of our forms being reversible, we can get basically four height adjusters out of each block up to an eight inch height with cross webs. So that's always the way I try and do it is to make sure that I can use the webs, use the blocks. I tend to get four pieces out of it and they're connected horizontally. Not necessarily the way to do it all the time. Sometimes you have to put the height adjuster in the middle of the wall and that's why we do the two-sided interlock. The downside to this particular such situation is you have one side that's flat, one side that's interconnecting. So you wanna make sure you're gonna put this at the bottom or the top of the wall so that you deal with that properly. So we're going to stack the forms again. If we're putting it at the top, you would get your height adjusted, figure out exactly where you have to be, and then cut them. Now, if there's a bunch of them to do, you may want to set up a table saw and run them all through at the same time. And it would look like so when you stack it on top of a wall. Depending on where the horizontal web is, based on the height of your height adjuster, you may want to put some extra reinforcing on there. It's the same principle as doing a footing. You're going to put a cleat on both sides with some crossers, and that will just keep that wall from tilting out on you on the top when you pour the concrete in there. Keeps it nice and straight, very strong. So the next item on the list is the roof, connecting the roof systems to our ICF walls. You're going to stack up your block to your desired height. Make sure the reinforcement's in place. Fill your concrete wall. While that concrete is still wet, you're going to go around and in, input your actual anchor bolts. You're going to make sure you leave it, whether it's one plate or two plates, make sure the threads are going to catch. And then you can put your top plate on. Trusses will come, you'll lay them in place, line them up, fasten them where they belong. Some areas you need to use hurricane clips. So there's an illustration of a hurricane clip holding those trusses down to that top plate. Carry on with your fascia, your sheeting, your freeze board, your strapping, whatever you need on there. So realistically, 
it becomes the same detail as fastening to a wood wall. It's just instead of nailing it, you end up having to put those anchors in to take your top plate. Add your siding, your finishing, and the details finished off. And you realistically you can't tell that that's an ICF wall. So on the Anvec webpage, anytime you want to get a hold of us, there's a contact us button. By all means, click on that give the information you need to contact whoever you need to. We also have a technical resources button. When you hit that, you will come up with lots of information available to support what you're trying to accomplish. We have guides and manuals on there. So the installation manuals, for instance, design guides. We have some 2D drawings, the product drawings, typical construction details. We also have some 3D modeling, BIM, if you're using Rivet or SketchUp. Then we have technical bulletins, whether it's uh, extra code compliance you're looking for, whether it's testing, whether it's installation or general EPS information, these are all included in our literature. On the bottom right, we also have a YouTube uh, link, that, and there's all kinds of videos on there to help you with your construction. Once again, we're going to thank you for attending. This is Marty McCartney saying thanks once again, and always know that the Anvic team is here to support your build.